yeah, walking, walking just allows you to connect with, with the world around you in a way that you can't, um, on a bike, even on a bicycle, you know, or obviously in a car, it's just a completely different experience. But again, I, I took some self-reflection. I said, but based on my personal political involvement throughout my life, this is the president I personally deserve. I really opted to try and do something about that. Hello, friends. Welcome to Mostly Harmless. I'm your host, Damn it, Damien. This week I'm chatting with two very wonderful people, Mr. Benjamin Claggett, who is currently in the middle of Texas. He is walking from Florida to San Diego, walking across the United States of America. And then we're also chatting with my dear friend, Mr. Jason Kutchma of the bands Red Collar and Jay Kutchma in the Five Fifths. Jason just recently ran as a Democrat in the very red state of Idaho for state senator. Now, why am I chatting with these two folks this week? Buddies, this week I needed some inspiration. I suffer from anxiety and depression. I'm currently on a nice prescription of Prozac. In case you guys didn't know in the last few months, I lost my job. I lost my insurance. Thought I wouldn't be able to afford my prescription drugs anymore. So I tapered off and slowly stopped taking my Prozac. Hell of a week to decide to go off my meds. I was not in a good place. I don't want to get into it too deeply. Luckily, I discovered that through Walmart, you can get $4 generics, uh, so I am definitely back on my meds. Uh, it was a very, very hard week last week, and I needed something inspirational. And as, as I'm going to tell my buddy Ben here in a couple minutes, I kept finding his Instagram post of him walking across America. Right now, he's in the heart of Texas. He is deep inside you know, this red territory, and Ben kept telling us these wonderful stories of the people he was encountering on his journey walking across America. At the very same time, I kept thinking of, of Jason's post that he made on election day about his run for state senate in Idaho. And he just kept, again, kept talking about the wonderful people he was meeting on both sides of the aisle. But he's, I needed something inspirational this week to help keep me going. And I found some really great stories. Unfortunately, Jason did not was not uh, into doing a Zoom meeting with us this week, and I almost axed the interview. But then I kept listening to the song of Jason's in my head, uh, the song Used to Believe. I remember the first time I heard it live, it brought me literally to tears of the triple nickel. I should have known then that I needed some serious mental health, you know, help. But it took a few years, and we're here now, buddies. And I couldn't get that song out of my head, and I couldn't get the story out of, out of my head. So listen to the interview watch it on YouTube. If you're like me, any of these YouTube podcasts I listen to are usually off in the background anyway, so it doesn't matter that there's no video. Jason's got a real cool story to tell. We're just lucky that we got Ben as well on this episode. He just happened to be stuck in the middle of a snowstorm in Texas, so he had some time and some Wi-Fi to chat with us. So, all right, buddies, I've rambled enough. If you like what we got going on here today, please subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, that's where we're all located. Uh, if I can get a thousand subscribers on YouTube, I can actually start making a little bit of money off this thing. Please subscribe on YouTube. It's the easiest way uh, to help support the show and put a couple dollars in my pocket. Uh, if you want to go one step further, we do have a Patreon page uh, in the link below. MostlyHarmlessPodcast.com will have all those links as well. Buddies, uh, let's go. Let's go hang out and chat with my buddy Ben in a motel room in Texas. And then we're going to have an audio interview with my dear buddy, Mr. Jason Kutchma, about running for state senate. Oh, hey, buddy. How are you? Doing good. I'm just waiting out a snowstorm in Ballinger, Texas. Why are you in Texas? Well, I am on my third walk across America. I started my current walk on November 11th in Jacksonville, Florida. Yesterday was my 60th day on the road. So since the 11th, I've walked about 1,345 miles to get into Ballinger. End destination is San Diego. So I'm more or less halfway there geographically nice. and mileage wise. So where are you right now? Pretty, pretty close to the center of the state, kind of 60 miles south of Abilene. I know te Texas is huge and I didn't know really anything about the geography in Texas or where anything was until I started walking through it. So more or less smack dab in the middle of the Lone Star State. First off, I want to congratulate you. So many of us like myself, the, I had so many late drunken night chats about like, I'm going to hitchhike across America. Not only did you talk about it, but you actually got up and you actually did it. Like, how did you get started walking across America? 
I don't know. It kind of goes back to just sort of the the lifestyle and what I tended to enjoy in my twenties. I just I loved traveling and I was never cut out for like the nine to five sort of job. So in my twenties, I I would save up money and then I'd go on like a long road trip across the country, camp in the back of my truck, stay at Walmart's, and my traveling just continued to get more simplistic as I got into my late twenties and. I went on a a self-supported cycling trip after I broke up with a girlfriend when I was 20, I was 26 or 27. Like we broke up and I was like, screw it. I'm going to take up cycling and like ride my bike from my sister's house in Kansas to South Florida. Like, I'm just going to do it. I I did it. And I like, I loved it. I, I loved it even more than the road trips because at that, at that point, you know, I was, I was drinking a lot and I wasn't in a good place as far as that was concerned. But when I was doing something physical and I was doing something healthy, it made me happy. And I was able to kind of push those demons aside momentarily. And then that cycling trip just kind of led into the walking. I met a guy named Jeff Godecker who had walked from New York City to central Missouri with a backpack on. And I met this guy when I was like a week and a half into my cycling trip. And it just like blew my mind that someone could walk that far. And it was just like, man, I'm doing this trip on a bike. Like I can go 60 miles a day. He's walking like 15 a day. And so Jeff just kind of left this impression in my brain. And after my cycling trip, I I had applied for a few different jobs and I was just kind of still in that same, I want to keep traveling. Like, I don't want to go back to work yet place. And, and like this walk across America and Jeff popped into my head one night and I got up and started researching it. And it was like, yeah, I think I, I think I could do that. And the more like blogs I read about it and the more I thought about it, it just, it made sense. You know, it's like, Oh, all you really have to worry about is one day at a time and, you know, just carry all the camping gear that you need. And, find a place to sleep every day and just do it, uh, you know, 200 times, 200 days, and you'll eventually get, get across the country. So that's sort of what, that's sort of what led into my first walk, that love of simplistic travel and just the allure of the, the adventure and the challenge. And yeah, that just all really appealed to me. Yeah, man. It's, it's incredible. Uh, this week I take uh, depression meds and I ran out of them this week. And I needed some inspiration and just doom scrolling away on Instagram. I kept coming across your posts and just going through and reading them. Your, your stuff was really, really beautiful and inspirational that, you know, maybe this world isn't such a bad place. Well, thank you. When you're out there on the road, when you're walking, this is your third trip. I imagine at this point, you know pretty well what to expect. What surprises you when you're out there walking on the roads? I, I generally know what to expect, but at the same time, every you know every day has its own set of challenges and every day really is a new adventure every every state has its own little quirks and and things that are different a good example texas has a lot of private property ranches and barbed wire fences so it's really tough to find places to to stealth camp where you know i just walk until the end of the day and then find somewhere in the woods that's not on private property to pitch my tent at night and then just get up and start rolling at like 5.30 or 6 the next morning. So I've had to start calling ahead to police stations and city halls and stuff in order to get permission to camp in parks and in different places like that. I guess the fact that I've done it twice before this walk gave me the confidence to know that I, you know, that I can handle it physically, mentally, and emotionally. But at the same time, the road has a way of of humbling you, whether it's with unpredictability or the weather or drivers aren't as courteous in one town as they are in another. So that always keeps me on my toes. And so I go into every day with this mindset that I don't know what I'm going to face today. I can, you know, I can do my best to set up a camping spot. I can do my best to like look at the road I'm going to walk on Google satellite and hope that it has that shoulder that Google's showing. But I also need to be prepared for unexpected stuff that's just going to come up. But as long as I have, you know, maintain that positive attitude and, you know, you just really have to roll with the punches, you know, that's the best way to handle like that, the adversity and, and the unknown that's bound to happen every day. What is it like when you call up these small towns and be like, hey, I'm walking? What is the response you're, you're getting from these guys? 
there, you know, it's there's typically a an element of surprise right off the bat. I always start every conversation with, I have a really random question for you. Um, like I kind of preface it like that. And then I give them my name. I tell them where I started this walk, where I'm ending. And then one thing that helps me a lot is I, I have my website, walkforsixty.com, and I'll give them my website and, you know, I'll kind of make a little joke out of it and be like, you know, you can go and visit my website. So, you know, that I'm not some like rebel rouser. I'm not some, you know, crazy drifter that's going to cause problems in your town. I'm literally just looking for a place to put my tent up for 10 hours sleep and I'll be out of your, you know, I'll be gone probably before the sun even comes up tomorrow. But there's, there is always like in, in some of these small towns, they, you know, whoever's answering the phone has never been asked by someone walking across the country if they can camp in their little small town. So it's just, it's unusual for them. So I do my best to make it comfortable for them, or at least know that they're not talking to some crazy person on the phone, you know? Uh, you mentioned your website, Walk for 60. Why, why Walk for 60? So the, the Walk for 60 theme, it was inspired or is inspired by my mother. My parents have a small business. And ever since I was just a little kid, my mom would walk from the home office at our house to the post office to drop off their business's mail. So she would go for this walk Monday through Friday, and it's about two and a half or three miles round trip. So it would take her 60 minutes. And she just always talked about how walking is, you know, it's her stress relief. It's her meditative time. She knows all the neighborhood dogs. She knows all the neighbors. She gets to experience the seasons on her walks. And I didn't appreciate the power of walking and just what it can do for a person's psyche, um, spirituality, physical health until I started doing it myself. And so like the, the walk for 60 goal is just to encourage and inspire people to incorporate 60 minutes of walking into their daily routines as a way to get healthier physically, mentally, and at least for me, spiritually. Um, so that's, that's what I, that's what I'm promoting while I'm doing this journey. Yeah. Walking, walking just allows you to connect with, with the world around you in a way that you can't, um, on a bike, even on a bicycle, you know, or obviously in a car, it's just a completely different experience. And that's one thing that I try to share with people. It's like, you just, you notice things while you're walking and your chances of a pleasant encounter with a neighbor or, you know, just increases exponentially when you're on foot. And that's a, that's a pretty amazing thing. What is your routine when you get started for the day? I typically wake up at five 30 or six in the morning um, I break down camp wherever wherever that happens to be. Um, I try to start walking a little bit before before the sun comes up. So usually walking no later than seven. And then the first the first hour, at least the first hour of my walks every day, I just walk in silence. It's sort of my 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 meditative portion of the day where I just kind of wake up the senses and you know, I, um, walking for me is meditative. So that first hour is just a great way for me to, um, just to kind of slow my brain down, calm my body down, connect, connect spiritually. I find in the morning is, is very, very helpful. And then I'll typically after that, put on some music and I'll usually try to walk seven or eight miles before I, I sit down and I eat my oatmeal and kind of have my, my breakfast. And then just sort of throughout the day, you know, I, I, typically try to walk anywhere from 25 to 30 miles a day. Yesterday I did 40 miles and in Texas, the towns, how far apart they are and where I'm camping has sort of dictated my miles. But typically I, I try to walk between 25 and 30 miles a day, which, which will usually take me anywhere from 10 to 12 hours. So I'll usually just walk for two or three hours at a time. And then I'll pop off on the side of the road and I'll usually journal midway through the walk just about what happened the previous day and keep up on that. And then just randomly throughout the day, I like to just stop on the side of the road and just stand there, look around, just try to take in my surroundings and be as present as possible. And then, you know, by the time that five o'clock rolls around, if I have, 
if I don't have a camping spot lined up, then before dark, that's when I'll start searching for one. I did that a lot early, early on my walk, just kind of a spot in the woods where I could just hunker down for the night, set up my tent after it gets dark, eat dinner. I have my social media hour where I do my Instagram and Facebook posts before bed and then go to sleep and wake up the next morning and do it all over again. So it's a pretty, pretty, con pretty consistent routine, really. I just started meditating this year, year, and I can't help but notice, you know, you talk about meditating and being present in the moment. Do you meditate as well? I do. Yeah. And, and like, you know, I know med meditations, I remember I didn't really discover it until um, I entered recovery. And like, it's a scary word. I don't know if it scared you before you started doing it, but maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe scared, maybe scared isn't the right word, but intimidated maybe, yeah. um, would be a little better. So I just always had this image of meditation in my head of being like, you know, sitting on a carpet, Indian, you know, Indian style legs crossed with a bunch of candles burning and a water feature in the corner of the room with like relaxing, relaxing music playing. Um, but for me, it's just more doing something that just calms my brain down and just brings me to wherever I am, whether that's walking or just sitting quietly in a room and just focusing on my breathing, whatnot. So that's what, that's what meditation looks like to me. Just anything that I can do that just relaxes me. But I, I love meditating and it, it, it's been really helpful. You did mention that you're you're sober these days when I because when you and I used to hang out, it used to be late at night, closing down bars and then whoever's house until four o'clock in the morning. Uh, yes. Sir. How, do you mind talking real quick about how you found that place and what how walking helped you achieve that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, and I love I love talking about it because it's it's part of being a recovering alcoholic is, you know, obviously a huge part of who I am, what I am, and what path my life is on right now. Um, I won't get into exactly what happened. That was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. But, um, you know, God hit me over the head with a two before and let me know that I need to stop drinking or um, it's either, it's either going to kill me or I'm just not going to be able to be the best version of myself that I can be. And that, that was on April 14th of 2017. From that point, it still took another couple of weeks until I, I finally started going to meetings and, you know, started on that, that new path. So May 14th of 2017 is my official clean date. And you had already, you had already successfully completed a walk across of America. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I had done that first walk and, and what's kind of, it, I tell people, you know, when I tell them that I've done one walk in recovery and one walk prior to my recovery, it, it can, it can confuse people. Um, you know, I, I think there's this, you know, there's this notion that, or this image of an alcoholic and, you know, it's, it's often the, the guy that's homeless underneath the bridge drinking a 40 out of a paper bag. That, that was the image that I had in my head too, before I realized that, that I, that I, that I'm an alcoholic. Um, but I was on my first walk, I was doing something that I loved and I was legitimately happy and I was able to kind of compartmentalize that part of my identity and I could just sort of push that out of my mind and focus on what I was, what I was doing. And that side of me wouldn't come out until I had a couple days off and I could go out to the bars and I could kind of, you know, turn it loose a little bit. But then once it was time to start walking again. I was able to, you know, put that back in the back in the cupboard and and forget about it. But as soon as my walk ended, I was back into my old, you know, destruct, destructive habits and my old ways pretty quickly. It didn't take long. So I I sort of thought that that first walk, if I could do that, that was some sort of way of proving to myself that I wasn't what I thought I was. Like that that was just kind of the way that I was thinking. It was like God, an alcoholic couldn't walk across America. There's no way. Yeah. But I did. So after, after I finally admitted that I had a problem and started a program of recovery, um, you know, about 10 months into it, I felt like I had the opportunity to do this walk again and do my second walk, but with this new lease on life and this completely different perspective. 
And that was just way too good of an opportunity to pass up. So that, that kind of led into my second walk. And I knew that I, I knew that I loved it. I knew that it was something that I was passionate about and excited about. I think that's part of why these walks make so much sense to me is because it, it forces you to live life one day at a time. As soon as I start thinking about how far away the Pacific Ocean is or what's going to be waiting for me in a month or two months or a thousand miles, it becomes so overwhelming that, um, you know, it's a, it becomes a very daunting task. But when I break it down to, okay, what do I need to do today to enjoy this walk? What do I need to do today to accomplish what I want to accomplish? And, you know, that's the same mindset that works for me in recovery. It's like, well, I just, I just need to stay sober today. I need to find a way to grow today. And if I can do that, everything else is going to work itself out. So the walk and my recovery have that, you know, that, that same mentality and that same mindset. So it really resonates with me. Yeah. It, it, it just seems to me like to me in my, in my head, walking across America, seems like such a big, big thing, um, mm -hmm. an impossible task. And I know it could feel that way to like an alcoholic, like, oh my God, I can never get over this. So did it help that you had already done this huge impossible task before you started your second walk across America and sobriety? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it definitely did. And I often do, you know, I, I compare, I compare my sobriety to that first walk. I didn't even, I didn't know that I was even doing it at the time, but on that first walk, I was practicing a lot of the same, you know, one day at a time, don't look too far into the future, just focus on what you can control right now. I was doing a lot of the same things that, that I've learned in recovery using some of the same tools and just applying them to the walk as opposed to applying them to, to my recovery. So that, that definitely helped. And knowing that I had accomplished that first walk and I was able, you know, I did have the, the mental toughness to do that and the determination to do that definitely um, helped, helped with the, you know, my ongoing recovery from alcoholism for sure. Yeah, it's been a hell of a year. So how are you doing it, dealing with it these days? Really, really well. I mean, as, as far as the, um, it's, it's pretty crazy. I never thought I, I would be a person that didn't, that didn't drink or didn't think about drinking. And it's like that, that, um, that obsession that I had before recovery has been removed. Um, I don't, I don't even think about it. I was taught, it's funny. I was talking with one of my, my buddies on the phone right before this interview. And he was like, do they have any bars in town? And he knows that I'm in recovery and he didn't mean anything by it, but I just laughed. And I was just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't like, it doesn't even, re it doesn't even register with me anymore. And you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty huge blessing for me, but I, I can still, if I don't maintain my spiritual contact, if I don't do the things that, that keep me mentally sane, that's, that's when I start to, you know, like it, everybody can relate to, to having some anxiety, especially in these times right now. So I have to continue to do the things that, that keep me mentally sane. And for me, that's, that's walking, that's praying, that's talking to people, that's being active in my recovery. If I do all those things, I'm a, I'm a very happy person and I'm pretty pleasant to be around. But if I don't, I tend to isolate and I sit in my problems and, and I do a lot of those bad habits that, that I used to solve with alcohol. Now, you know, I'm just, I'm stuck with me. I'm stuck with this brain. There's nothing to avoid me. So I've got to do, I've got to do all those other things that keep me mentally stable. If not, you know, it, it can get pretty messy in here. I don't know if I, I hope that makes sense. Um, no, no, it totally does. <laughs> uh, I, I was just thinking to myself, like, I hope with, with these things, I try to try to have people talk about inspirational things, hoping that at least one person gets inspired by whatever we're talking about. And like after the week I just had, this is all really good stuff for me to remember to put in my bank. So I think maybe I'm the one we're helping this week. So, you know, <laughs> thank you for the uh, therapy class. Oh man. <laughs> um, no, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, so you're out there, you're walking around, you're outside, of course, almost uh, the entirety of your walks, but we are, of course, in the middle of a pandemic. What are the challenges you're running into while out there in a pandemic? 
you know, it's been it's been interesting. Obviously, like that was the biggest thing that I was I was concerned about going into this walk was, you know, what am am I going to be able to do this and keep not only myself safe, but people around me safe. And so, you know, I, I essentially take the same precautions on the road as I would when I'm at home. I have a I have a couple of boots that are hanging from the back of my jogging stroller. And I have a big bottle of hand sanitizer in there. So before I go into a gas station, I sanitize the crap out of my hands and put on a mask and, you know, follow all the local guidelines. And I, I do, I do whatever I can do to keep myself and to keep others safe. I am, you know, outside, like you said, it, I would say 99.999% of the time I'm outside and by myself. My stroller can carry about four or five days worth of food and water. So there are often three day stretches where I don't go inside of a gas station or inside of a grocery store. And that's that's one great thing about traveling this way is, you know, typically when I do talk to people, I'm already outside. I don't I don't dine in. I think I've I've gone to two restaurants on my entire walk and actually eaten inside. So if I do go into a gas station, it's just briefly I'm in and out to get a cup of coffee or something. You go grocery shopping twice a week. So at least in my mind, when I was thinking about the logistics of the trip, where I was going to be, how isolated I was going to be, there wasn't a di- really a difference between the number of shopping trips that I'll take on my walk versus if I was at home or going to a gas station versus when I was at home. You know, and I. I know that there are some people that would still disagree with my decision to walk right now, but at least from my perspective and in what I believe in my heart, I've been safe and I've kept people around me safe and I've taken the precautions that I've needed yeah. to in order to, you know, respect the pandemic and respect the people that are around me. Well, one of the things I like is like right now, there's so much toxicity on the internet. Like I can just scroll through and when I find your posts, you really are spotlighting some wonderful things about this country and about the people you're finding. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is you're walking through all these red states, you know, more right wing, whatever you'll, whatever you have it. And I don't know your political affiliations, but so many people just have this like narrow idea of what, what and who these people are in the South. What are your encounters like with these people that you're meeting on the road that are stopping and talking to you? Like what, what, what are some of the surprising elements of that? I mean, that's, that's a great question. And there is no doubt that I have been in Trump country pretty much for this entire walk. I, I would say that nine, 90%, if a house is flying a flag out front, supporting a political person it's a trump flag you know that that being said anybody that's you know stopped and talked to me whether they're wearing a maga hat or not because there have been a few of those have legitimately been stopping to me stopping me because they're interested in what i'm doing and they're looking for a way to help i've had so like texas i've been getting stopped multiple times a day by people offering me a ride into town Yesterday I had a I had a guy that drove past me and I'm I'm going to love telling this story for years. His name was Bruce and he pulled his pickup truck over on the side on the shoulder of the road and got out and came up and introduced himself to me and I mean this guy was a, a Texas cowboy to a T. He had a he had a half-burned cigarette in his mouth and was dressed in denim from head to toe and cowboy hat on and he uh you know he told me I, I saw you out here walking and I wanted Put together a care package for you. I said, okay. Um, so he was like, I'm gonna go get it for my truck. So he walks to his truck and he comes back with this giant duffel bag. I mean, like this thing was the same size as my jogging stroller. And this guy went shopping for me and put towels and toilet paper and all of these different things in this bag. And I felt bad that I couldn't bring the whole thing with me, but it just was like, I can't carry that much stuff. So I took all the food off of his hands and, and a roll of toilet paper. So, you know, that, that stuff's as good as currency now. You know, like things like that just happen every day. It's, it's amazing. And that is my, my favorite part of this journey is sharing those, those small gestures of kindness. Because, some, you know, sometimes it's, at least for me, all that it takes is someone going out of their way just to say hello. You know, like, what are you doing out here? Like, you want to visit for a minute? And 
someone giving me a soda, like just that, that small act of kindness, you know, resonates with me and it just, it re reverberates through the universe. You know, I, I love sharing those stories because I feel like things like that are happening all over the country. People are doing nice things for one another, but all of that gets lost because of just the, you know, the current state of affairs and just so many negative things on the news. That's kind of my, my little role that I like to play is just sharing those stories with people just as a reminder, like there are good people everywhere, you know, whether it's in, whether it's in the South or, you know, out West, I mean, any, anywhere there's good people. And I honestly, I haven't noticed, you know, I'm sure there have been plenty of, there have been plenty of people on both sides of the aisle that have helped me out on this walk. I guess I, I guess when you're out there, it just, I just don't think about it. You know, it's yeah. just, this person is helping, which is, which is interesting because it is a very polarized time. Hell of inspiring stuff there, my friend. Thank um, you. How, how much, how many more days do you have on this trek? Um, you know, my, my goal when I started was to do it in about 120 days. I'm 60 days in, uh, geographically, I'm a little over halfway there. Mileage wise, I'm roughly halfway there. So I'm, I'm more or less right on schedule. It's funny when, when people asked how long my walk was going to take before I started, I always said exactly four to eight months because I, I had no idea what was going to happen with COVID or the weather or my stroller. There's just so many variables that are out of my control. At least, you know, the first 60 days have been kind of time-wise the, the, the best case scenario. So if things continue to progress as they have been, I always feel like I have to put this big disclaimer out there. If things continue to go as they have been, I'm looking to get into San Diego in the middle of March. So about, about another two months, about another two months on the road. Damn, dude. Obviously you're not working. Do you have, how do you, how are you surviving? Up? So it's, it's actually the way, the way that I do it, it's not as expensive as a lot of people think. You know, my, my budget is about 15 to $20 a day. And the majority of that is food. You know, some of that's earmarked for shoes and for new gear and stuff that I need to purchase along the way. I punctured a couple of sleeping pads early on because my tarp wasn't thick enough, you know, just little things like that. I mowed grass all summer. I worked for a, a residential lawn mowing company in Colorado Springs. Um, and I just squirreled away some money while I was doing that for six months this last summer. And then I, I you know, I have had a lot of generous people that I've met that have, you know, donated and, and helped me out with some of the daily expenses. I've had friends from back home, get me hotel rooms for the night, like my, my hotels for these three nights that I'll be staying and in, in Ballinger were paid for by friends from back home and another friend in Wyoming. So, you know, just more, more kindness from people that are supportive of me and what I'm doing. And obviously that, that helps so much, you know, every, every, every penny helps and kind of lessens that financial burden a bit. So where are you headed next? And if people want to stop and help you, how can, how can they help you? So from Ballinger, um, I'm walking up through, I'll just give you the, the big, the big towns. Cause I can't remember the highway numbers off the top of my head. There's so many of them up over to, uh, Sterling city, Texas, big spring, Texas, Andrews, Texas, and then cutting over to Carlsbad, New Mexico. And then from Carlsbad, I'll kind of be dropping back down into Texas for Texas part two and walking over to El Paso. So a little bit north and then back down south to avoid some of the high traffic uh, oil and gas areas of West Texas. So that I think um, El Paso is about 450 to 500 miles from here. So that'll be about the next three weeks to an Two, yeah, three three weeks probably. And then from there, kind of over to uh, Tucson, up to Phoenix, and then into California from Phoenix. I post daily to my Instagram account, which is Ben, B-E-E-N underscore walkin, and then to my Walk for 60 Facebook page. Um, so that's, it, you know, that's... I'll, I'll have the links to all those in the video description and everything below too. Okay, awesome. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a good way to find where I am too, because I post my, my towns and my location and where I walked daily. And then, you know, if, if anyone is inclined to, 
to help and make a donation on my website, walkforsixty.com. I have a donations link on there if, if anybody wants to help me boost my peanut butter supply because I eat a, a, a ridiculous amount of peanut butter, about 12 ounces a day. So <laughs> I wish I was kidding. What are you going to do with all these experiences? Uh, are you going to write a book? Are you going to yes. where? Yes, that's the goal. Cool. Yep. That's yeah, that's the that's the ultimate goal. And back in May, after I moved back to Colorado from Hawaii, I pretty much just wrote for about three weeks. So I finished a draft about my first walk and a draft about my second walk. Um, but that, you know, the, the story wasn't over. There was a walk across the South that was missing. So I think ultimately, at least in my head right now, it's just going to be a, a collection of stories, my favorite stories from the journey, from my three journeys and, you know, what it, what it's taught me about life, about life and sobriety and, I'm just hoping that it, that it'll serve as inspiration to anyone who's struggling with an addiction. That there's there's hope out there. There's help, and just the the power of taking a step and just starting a task that seems insurmountable or impossible by just taking a single step and then continuing to take steps after that. You know, that's just how I try to look at look at life nowadays and just continuing to grow and improve one day at a time. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I'll harass you again in a few weeks or months or whatnot and uh, check in and see how this, this trip's going. Like I, 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 again, I'm going to, I'm going to say one more time, I'm, I'm really loving all the stuff and I, I'm like, why aren't there thousands of people following this story on Instagram right now? So I'm going to try <laughs> to do my best to get more people paying attention. Cause again, it, it comes from a genuine place. I really do uh, love what you've been doing. Like it's, it's fucking cool. Thank you, Damon. I, I appreciate that. I really, I really, really do. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before I let you go? No, I, I just really, I just really hope that my, my story and my experiences just, you know, shine, shine some light, throw some hope out there to people. And, you know, if you, if you need help, seek help. It all starts with just taking that first step and then continuing to, to take steps after that. That's what I found anyway. Hey, man. Hey. Yeah, thanks for accommodating me, by the way. I've, um, I, I don't, uh, I've done the, the kind of Zoom thing, uh, as a lot of people have over this past year. And it's, it's just, I think that I kind of start gravitating towards like performance on doing those things as opposed to just talking. So thanks for accommodating. It's it's funny that you don't want to do like the Zoom stuff because you have movie star good looks. I was like watching oh. a video today and I was like, had you been born in a different era, you would have been like a 1950s Hollywood cowboy star. You know? <laughs> that's, that's, that's very generous. Thanks. <laughs> uh, where are you living right now? Uh, we, we are in South, Southwest Idaho. Are you, are you still teaching at all? No, I had um, I signed up to be a substitute teacher at the School of the Arts uh, here in, in Idaho, and um, I had about a year or uh, six months where they were asking me to come in and come in. But right at the time, I was I, I found a drummer here, and we we were recording and just the uh, the hours for working on rock and roll is not conducive to the end. <laughs> the hours of teaching and uh, so I never haven't gone back and then uh, when COVID uh, started happening uh, uh, then I thought well there's no way in hell I'm going to be I'm going to be substituting doing this thing and so so I haven't no it's it's always you know a thought of going back to at least uh, substitute but uh, no I haven't 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 done it and uh, fortunately haven't needed to either I, I never had the patience for being a teacher and you uh You've always struck me as a very like somebody who's tapped into like this deep well of patience over the years. I, I don't know if that for sure. That's just my my instinct. It, it is. Um, thanks. Yeah, that, um, that is. It's something that I've uh, worked on, but it's like we were talking before about working on houses. It's the same thing. I didn't, when I first started teaching, I was very impatient and I wasn't very good. And I run into my student here and then whenever I go back to the towns that I taught in and it's, they're very complimentary, you know, about it. Again, I, I look back on those years, I think, oh, I could have done so much better. And it's only have those substitute teaching years. That's whenever I really, felt like I, I was strangely enough i came into my own with teaching i was a lot more uh, just patient with myself and with the students and it's very tough to to come out of the gate out of college and being in your early to mid 20s to you know to be, try and be a 
to try and be a teacher of excellence. That's, that was very, that's very tough for anybody. And it was especially tough for myself. So the real reason why I wanted to talk to you today in the last 12 months, you, you ran for a state office. Yes. How did this even enter your mind to even run for office? In the- it started, uh, several, um, years ago. I, I think that I had uh, most of my life, uh, the same, uh, the same, political involvement that most people do, which is, you know, you read the headlines and, and, uh, this is throughout my life, you know, throughout many presidencies and you become infuriated at certain things and, and you feel relieved at, at other headlines. And, and then you make your opinions known to the people around you and, and maybe to a letter to the editor at the time, or, you know, and then it, that became letting your opinions known online. And I was wondering, how much good that was really, how much good that actually did. You know, it was nice to express these things and and I'd get in political conversations with people, but I don't know if it was actually doing anything. And uh, in 2016, with the the two candidates for presidents, uh, for the presidency, I, I didn't really connect with either of them. And I thought at the time, well, you know, this is based on my, political involvement, my, my personal lifetime political involvement. These are the two options I deserve. And then when we got the president that we got, it, I was disappointed. But again, I, I took some self-reflection. I said, but based on my personal political involvement throughout my life, this is the president I personally deserve. I really opted to try and do something about that. And I went to, it was like a, it was a, it was a day long political organizers meeting in, in Dallas in January of uh, 2017. And it was, you know, it was people that were you know, really kind of excited at the time, if I remember correctly, both the Democrats and Republicans were a bit kind of, you know, not like deflated, but this particular group in, in January, they were, you know, they were kind of, they were really excited about, you know, the political future. And, and this was organized by, by some Bernie delegates in Texas that had met from in Philadelphia, I think. Uh, but they were all from Texas and they all got along really well. And they said, well, we should really try and, you know, get, maybe get people involved a little bit more in politics. And, it was maybe an eight hour, eight to 10 hour session. And they had all kinds of, you know, people talking just about how, how you can make a difference and, you know, with grassroots and organizing and, and the, but the, mo- the thing that really connected with me is at some point during the day, somebody said this, the, the most bang for your buck, the best thing you could possibly do as far as time investment and in getting something out is to become something called a precinct captain. Every uh, every state is broken down into counties, and every county is broken down in the country. Every county is broken down into districts, and every district is broken down further into precincts. And precincts um, are composed of anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 uh, registered voters. They, depending on the the uh, population density, it could be a, a wide a wide area, you know, very, very spread out, but it can also be just a few blocks, like in, say, in New York City or I'm assuming L.A., where it's just a few blocks you have, you know, that many voters in it. And and what a precinct captain is, you're in charge of uh, voter outreach uh, to those 1,500 to 2,500 people. So I, whenever I came to, uh, we moved from uh, Texas to Idaho, I, the first step was I read through the platforms of, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know, and even now, I'm not even, you know, sure, for defiant, definitely, which which political party I'm, you know, I, I am. I, uh, there's times I really wonder. However, I read through the platforms of both the Democratic Party and Republican Party in Idaho, and I am for sure a Democrat in Idaho. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd be a Democrat in other states because I haven't read their platforms, but I can say for certainty, I'm a Democrat. In, in Idaho, I read through their the, the state platform, and um, you know, with it I, uh, for for about seventy percent of it, you know, I'm willing to, you know, so I say, well, I'm a Democrat in Idaho, uh, and I went to a, I looked, uh, found when the local, my county Democrat meeting was happening, and I went to the meeting, and 
they asked me why I was there and I said, told them the story that I just told you. And I said, so I'm here to work for my, you know, find a precinct captain and work for them. The, the person in Texas said that, you know, if, if you work, help find meet, find your precinct captain, help them, assist them in any way, you know, you can, it, it, there's nothing, there's no amount that's trivial uh, that you can possibly give, you know, help to them. And if you, you know, help them if you can, but if you don't like the person or don't think the jobs that they're doing is, is good, then run against them and become a precinct captain. And so I told them, and then they said, well, uh, they looked down a list. They said, it turns out you don't have a precinct captain. Would you like to be one? And I said, yeah, sure. So I started not really organizing. I, 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 just, I mostly, I went to the meeting and just kept my mouth shut for about a year. And then in 2018, I started knocking on doors in my precinct. I think I knocked on about 200 doors and um, just telling them about when when the election is being held for, and where it's being held, the midterm election in 2018. I gave them a list of our candidates and I told them what their policies, what they were for. And that's kind of it, you know. And so then in, in the meantime, I tried to recruit other precinct captains um, because it's, I can't, I, I can't remember the statistic of what it is in Idaho, but it's, um, or even nationwide. I mean, if you, it's it's astounding how many precincts don't have precinct captains in them. There's just nobody doing any of this work at all. And it it really started to strike me that I had such a top down mentality, not just with politics, but maybe everything. You know, economics or entertainment or, or whatever. I looked to the top of the pyramid. You know, I looked to who the president was. Not really, not really understanding that it's. Um, there, there's a phrase in politics that the, the person, the closer a politician's door is to your house, the more they affect you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, there, you know, d don't get me wrong. I mean, that there's some policy that's come out of, you know, out of D.C. on the federal level that affects people's lives, you know, profoundly. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it is the it is the local offices and the local it, the, the local politicians that affect your life on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that is, you know, education, if you have kids or if you're going to school or if it's transportation, getting to it from work or um, the kind of work that's available or the kind of taxes that you're paying and where that's going and health care. That's a lot of that is decided at a very, at a state level. And, and, and those people live within a couple miles of your house. And um, and those elections are, are are won by you know dozens dozens or hundreds or you know th only thousands of votes. It's it's incredible. And so I started to be committed to that idea a little bit more. And and I tried to recruit precinct captains and uh, not without much luck. But you know who wants to do that? It's it's such a it's a very red state in Idaho. I think eighty two percent of our our state offices are held uh, by Republicans, and, and so I think a lot of the, you know, Democrats have kind of just shrugged and, and said, well, you know, I'm out of, uh, I've run into this several times where people have changed their party just to be unaffiliated or, or Republican, you know, at least so they have an opportunity to have their voice heard in some way because it's it's so – the Democrat population in Idaho is very small. Yeah, so it's uh, it was it was going well, and then I one day I thought <laughs> I talked to my the the people and uh, that are heading the party in in my county, and I said I'm not sure why I'm recruiting people because I'm recruiting them to vote, but there's nobody to vote for. The guy the who is my state representative uh, out of the past 14 or 16 years, he's only had two Democrat opponents, and he's just I, I, and I was astounded by that that you, you know you can. Uh, you can win your primary in May and just walk into to the office in November and there's no debate. There's nothing. He, you know, he doesn't have to answer questionnaires. He doesn't have to do anything because there's there's simply nobody running against him. And and even from the primary um, standpoint, I think in that 14 or 16 years, he's only had one one Republican challenger. And so I really thought that, you know, this phrase I, I and I don't understand what good. Uh, you know, freedom is, is if you only have one choice and what good is a democracy if there's only one candidate? It's, it's absurd, but that is, and I, and I'm not, this isn't some diatribe against, you know, the candidate, my state representative or, you know, the, the, the political machine.
machinery of Idaho at all. I'm sure it's the exact same way in blue counties as well. And I firmly believe that there should be um, competition. You know, there should be debate on, on every 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 time we have an election. You know, people should be refer to that, not just uh, I. Well, I I vote this way because my grandfather did, or I always vote this way, or whatever. You know, and and so I decided to run, and I put my name in, and and uh, and that's that's yeah, that's where I, that's where I'm at. That's that's a hell of a story. I don't know the mechanisms of voting. Only this year, and only because I was stuck at home watching PBS News <laughs> every day, did I start to learn some of these things. So that, mm-hmm. that's that's fascinating. So is this guy that you ran against? Is he a bad guy, or you just wanted to put your name in there to give somebody a choice? We definitely have some policy differences. You know, to I don't know. I don't know if I'm. You know, like to say. You know, a bad guy. Right, I don't, right, if it was, it, it didn't. I don't. I think I would have ran. It didn't. It wouldn't have mattered if I would have ran, uh, or it didn't. It would. Um, excuse me. It wouldn't have mattered what he, what the character of this person was like. I still would have put my name in the hat. Um, you know, to to run. And uh, if I was a Republican, uh, I would have in Idaho. I would have absolutely put my name in the ring to run in the primaries. Absolutely. I think that's a you know the bit. There's a lot of disappointment you know in in the system. My biggest issues is that I was running for uh, running with is education and uh, and just to you know put this all in perspective though, uh, Idaho is fifty um, first uh, in the country oh, wow. with that that be with per capita education spending. Uh, I think that there's a lot of that's the root of a lot of our problems. How do you find the confidence and courage to do this? It was a slow. Uh, building of confidence and and it always is it's it's still you know it it still is trying to find out more information about issues and to get your confidence on on a platform there is a lot of talking uh, with people and in the very beginning of knocking on doors in uh, 2018 I was very nervous and just you know kind of said hi my name's you know, Jason, here's a piece of paper. <laughs> and uh, then you, you really, if, if you can, if I, whenever I was doing that, I said, well, that's, that's a piece of paper of, of stated opinions and, and policy of, of people that I like, but I don't, I don't know about this person and what they, you know, um, what they like and what they need and what their concerns are. And so Whenever it's not so much a, like confidence, you have to I'm not sure how to phrase it. It was, uh, you know, I, I gained my confidence by really talking with a lot of people as honestly as I as I could, and to do my best not to demean, you know, anybody. I mean, to and to try and hang on to as much patience as as you can, because people are very frustrated. You know, I mean, it's it doesn't matter. This country is full of people profoundly. Uh, frustrated and disappointment disappointed in the direction of the country which is which is fascinating you have people on the both the right and the left in the middle of the right in the middle of the left and the people in the middle and the people that are around on both ends and and, and nobody's happy yeah. <laughs> you know like i don't know i don't know anybody in my district that say I, there are very few times that i talked to somebody that said and everything's just fantastic you know people are, are very disappointed in, in how either the state or the, the country has been going and uh, and I think regardless of what party they were you know I'd try and find find something if they'd let me you know that yeah. trying to try and find something there so that lets the lets the confidence I can say well yeah if, if it's just me if I'm just saying well this is what I stand for and this is what I believe in and you know and this is what it, then you're just and then you have to be backed by facts and you know, a lot of facts and a lot of figures and, you know, from varying you know sites about that. But if but if you say, look, I, I talk to a lot of people and it's they're very concerned being 51st in the in the country with per capita education spending, um, then that just gives you that's that's where the confidence comes from. You're having honest conversations with people who are 
I believe being honest with me about their issues and and that's there, there's a confidence that comes through that because it's it's just I don't have any, really anything to gain you know by it I mean maybe a vote but I, I wasn't really even counting on that yeah I was gonna ask you know what were your expectations going into this like it seems like you you didn't expect to win <laughs> yes that that's true it is um I think my district Okay, so I was precinct captain, but I was running for state representative. And a district, my district is about, I think, 20, 20 or 21,000 voters in a district. And out of 20, let's say 20,000, just to make the math easier, but out of 20,000, there's only 2,200 registered Democrats. So it's 12% or something. And out of that, uh, and then there is... Uh, maybe six or seven thousand unaffiliated. They don't. They're not called independents. They're called unaffiliated. They're you know neither party. And there's a small percentage of libertarian. I think the Constitution Party, uh, but a vast majority, well over fifty percent, is a registered Republican. Yeah, it was. I think in the beginning, I I thought you know I I don't remember getting a call from a precinct captain in my life. And just to have, like, you know, somebody to say, look, I'm, I really am listening. I mean, I don't, I, and I'd be honest with people. I'd, I'd tell them the odds are, are against me. You know, I do, if, if there is going to be a debate between me and the other candidate, I will bring up the issues that the, the people that I've talked to, the, the things that they're concerned about. That was a lot of the goal, is to find out who, you know, what kind of people are in my district. Maybe how politics is now is, is, I don't know if it's – I think that people say – they look at candidates and they say, aha, they represent me. Like they – what they stand for, you know, can represent me. But I looked at this a little bit different way in in saying, well, I'd tell people what I stand for, but then I would also talk to them if they would tell me an issue that um, maybe I – didn't agree with, I would tell them. I said, well, that's, I'll just be honest with you. That's not something I, I can represent, but I can't, but those are the issues we talked about. That's something I can represent for you. And, uh, but that's, that this third issue is something that I, I disagree with, and that's not going to be a priority of mine uh, as a representative. So it was, a lot of it was to find out what kind of people were in my district and what they really did care about. And if I was, and if I truly felt that I can represent those issues, and if I didn't, then I, don't, I, I, I already threw my name in the hat, but I wouldn't run, you know, again. But if I thought, okay, well, the pattern is, you know, a lot of people are concerned about this issue and this issue and this issue, issue regardless of party, those are issues that I can represent. Therefore, I think that I would be a good representative. Nice. And. It, winning, you know, I, I've had the conversations with people on and said, they said, you don't plan on winning. And I said, and some people, I said, yes, I plan, I'm, I, I'm not running, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running because you, you do feel that way, you know, sometimes like I can do it, you know, I'm going to do it. But, you know, realistically, you know, I wasn't, but that wasn't, that wasn't my goal. I, I, I wanted there to be another choice for people, A. And it was also... I would tell them, you know, throughout my life, I've found that, you know, if you to win doesn't mean you're always going to do the right thing. And but sometimes doing the right thing doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win. And um, so I'm not doing this. You know, winning is the furthest thing from my mind. It is there's some other level to this that I'm trying to trying to make give me some peace you know really it does seem like you gained a ton of knowledge and then isn't that winning as well yeah and um it it is um it is whenever you insist on talking to people and, and truly listen some of these conversations i mean some of them were very quick some of them were as soon as they heard the word democrat uh it was you know they hung up the phone but then there were other conversations it was easily an hour I mean, easily an hour. And it was a challenge, you know, t- you know, to myself about it. And I think the, you know, the theme about patience, you know, that we've been, you know, that is slowly slipping in here. And uh, from a, a, another, a larger aspect, psychologically, what this does to a voter, okay, just, you know, if you, the, the next day, all right, the Wednesday newspaper comes out or online and you see um, the name of a person, Okay, candidate A, and then right beside them, it has a percentage and it has a number of votes that they got. 
psychologically, if you see beside that person's name 100%, that means that that starts to work against the people that may not be that color in that particular district. You think, oh, God, they got 100% of the vote. I don't feel this way, you know, that I like this person at all. I don't think they've done a good job at all. I think they're terrible on policy, but I must be the only one person that the point zero 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 one percent in my district that doesn't that didn't vote for this person i think that psychologically that starts working against people but if you see that that person's name they didn't get 100 percent of the vote they got 70 percent of the vote or whatever it might be even 80 percent of the 90 percent of the vote it doesn't matter there's that 10 percent and if you if you are somebody who you know feels like an outlier regardless of your issues then you can you could say well at least at least there's other people like me out there you know at least i can try and build on this or it, it, psychologically i feel a little bit better about this and so for those people i think that i i at least you know did something for them for those of you listening to this in the future doing this, this recording a week after all right protesters stormed the capitol i was really looking for something really, really looking for something inspirational and i just kept thinking about your story your post on facebook talking about how you didn't call just blue people you, you called everybody and you sat and you talked to people and i wrote this quote down because i liked it so much from that post it's uh in a year full of red and blue protests and riots it seems like the most radical thing i could have done is to talk to people people aren't actually talking we're not learning from each other and then you did the work. You, like you got out there and you were learning, and that that was hugely inspirational for me. And I just kept coming back to that this week. What surprised you about calling all these people? Because there were some similarities. What what surprised you? Uh, there there was uh, one conversation I remember that was. I mean, I I think in the beginning I was just preparing myself to get my you know just to get kicked over and over again i spoke with a couple of people who act who had some um excellent policy uh, points uh one particular uh woman she was a republican but i think that i think that she was recently had switched parties or was a lifelong republican and and was um was disappointed in, in the you know in our presidency and and had switched parties um but she was great. She had very insightful how to, dealing with um, the economics of COVID and what to do with tax money and how to move it around in a fair way that um, I, I thought was so was just great that nobody was really talking about. And uh, what what she had said, and this this is something that I really learned from, and not only learned from it, but then I would you know bring this up to other people that I was that I was talking to and. There's there's an attitude I think in you know in the country where it's um, they don't you know the, the the phrase redistribution of wealth you know but you and a lot, there's you know a certain segment of, of America that just hates that hates that idea and thinks that this should be a you know a sink or swim you know situation but with COVID there were uh, lots of lockdowns uh, with restaurants and with um, bars and restrictions on capacity. And a a lot of uh, bars in Idaho, at least in the densely populated parts where where we live, relatively dense, they were, you know, closing, either closing down or or limited their uh, limiting their occupancy or spacing their tables, you know, six feet apart and not letting anybody at the necessary drink at the bar, you know, doing whatever they had to do or what what the governor was uh, either asking or requiring of them, you know, at the time. And, and, uh, and what was happening is they were, they were staying afloat, but there was a lot of lost sales, obviously, because of lack of either restricting capacity or people just weren't coming out. However, what they, the people were doing is they were going to the liquor store and they were buying beer and they were buying wine and they were drinking at home. And, that revenue that was generated by the state liquor stores and by the state taxes on beer and on wine, it ended up, I mean, being, it was like 40%, I mean, over what they normally make. It was, it was this huge windfall 
um, for them. The one lady at the liquor store that I talked to, she said that this was, you know, this, we've had weeks and weeks and weeks after week where our store has done better than our single day that we've ever done, which was right before, <laughs> like, the millennium, you know, changed this this huge either party or when people thought it was all going to end, they really stocked up. And she said, we've been consistently doing, you know, business over that. Well, if the state is going to make these requirements on businesses and they are going to, you know, uh, but then get the windfall, reap the benefits of these restrictions, well, then the state should take that money and and do and give it in some way as a reimbursement to these bars and restaurants. And I thought that was such an incredible, obvious, yeah. I mean, that is such an obvious idea, <laughs> but nobody's doing it. Yeah, Not I, at least in Idaho. That, that was one thing that surprised me. I was, um, I, th- um, I was, uh, I was very surprised. I'm not surprised, um, but when when you're 51st in the country with per capita education spending, you just assume that. Um, and walking into the state, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not from here, and I know people that are from here, and they just shrug and say, "Well, that's the way it's always been." I thought that there was there would be some, you know, acquiescence or some people that I talked to that said, "Well, that's that's the way it's been, and that's that's how we like it." But very rarely, regardless of party, did I did I find somebody that said that was that was you know saying, well, yeah, it's fifty first in the country, but I like my money more than I like the education for my kids. You know, that was just a very, I don't, I didn't, it would that crossed party lines. You know, people were, it's it's it's. I think people were very embarrassed by this. What were some of the other things that crossed uh, you know party lines? What are some of the other things that people out there in your neck of the woods are caring about? Uh, trans, well, uh, I, and I would say this is probably applicable to any, any County and any state in America yeah, and I believe education, that. you know, education, funding, uh, transportation and, uh, and growth. Those are the biggest issues and it's, you know, and either people are places that are growing, there's other places that are shrinking. And so it is th- those three issues over and over again, kept on coming up. And I would specifically ask people. I'd say, you know, what um, what issues um, can that you can think of from a state or local level uh, that you're that you'd be most concerned about? And a lot of people had to pause for for quite some time. If you say what issues are you concerned with politically? Oh God, they, you just you you've opened up the dam. But if you you know they will go and oh on and on and on about these national issues. But if you if you phrase it in the sense of uh, and they start talking about this and say, well, hold on a second. I'm not running for a federal representative. I'm not running for, you know, I'm running for a state representative specifically to our county, uh, you know, in our district, 21,000 people. What are you the problems? And it's, yeah, I really wish I'd fix this pothole. I really wish traffic was better. I really wish my kid was getting a better education. You know, over and over again, I really wish that they were better. Uh, somebody was mining the store with, with growth in here. I really miss the farmland that's, you know, that's, that's, um, leaving. And with people on the right, I mean, these old time farmers that I would talk to and they would, they would read me the right act of how they would never vote, ever vote for a Democrat. Uh, they don't, and I would tell them, they'd ask me what I'd do. And I'd say to a musician and they'd, they'd say, do you even know, are you, you, do you even know anybody that works, a, that actually works a blue collar job for a living? You know, I don't and like they would say, I don't I don't agree with your life's musician. It's a very it's a re- very religious you know, area. I mean, it's the second highest uh, Mormon population in the country and and a, a very conservative area. And but I would I would tell them flat out how I felt about uh, the growth that was going on in this area and how it's out. It's out of control and, and something needs to be done. But I would tell them, you know, if I introduce anything that you and I agree upon with where we are trying to control this in any way, people are going to call me a socialist. They're going to say, you're just another liberal that wants to, you know, that wants to have the government tell people what they can and cannot do. And I said, well, yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't think your farmland should be, you know, should be, you know, replaced with this, this topsoil that you're working with. This is some of the most valuable topsoil in the world. And it's getting buried by driveways. And it's getting buried by sidewalks. Why? Because people can pay. And I said, something has to be done. You, you got in there and you talked to people and you figured out, you know, their, what really is troubling them on a day to day in their lives. And that's just, inc- 
I don't know of anybody else really doing that. I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is thank you for doing that and thank you for sharing these stories. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was. Um, well, thanks for saying that. It was. Um, I, I would talk with people who. I would see what they respond with um, online and, uh, you know, friends and family members. I think, man, that was so brilliant. Like what they wrote was was so insightful and they just nailed it. And they would be getting, they would be in the middle of some argument, you know, online. And I remember calling one of them and saying, hey, I'm just so impressed by, you know, what you do online. I mean, it's, you're really insightful and, and uh, you always seem to be able to back up what you have to say with either, um, you know, some policy or statistics that seem to settle the issue. And I'd ask them, how often do you do this? They say all the time. And I said, now, here's the question. You have to have some self-effacement with this. How often does it do any good? And they said, never. They said it never does any good at all. And this is the person who I would consider is the most insightful with with their with coming with their comebacks, you know, with people. And they said never does any good. And I thought, well, then then I'm not going to do it. <laughs> if it's not if it's not going to do any good, then I don't know. You know, I just rather just rather do this. And uh, I think that there was I. One of the, the phrases that I think that I w- w- talk with somebody whenever it just it didn't get heated, but it just and it didn't get tense, but it, it got very you're talking very honestly and, and rawly uh, with somebody about uh, issues. And they were maybe, you know, accusatory uh, of either my party. There is an understanding that I always had to have is I'm coming into this. I'm talking to somebody who has been listening to hours and hours and hours of, of somebody telling me I'm bad, you know, I'm, I'm a bad person and, and I'm not going to, that's baggage like that. They, they, I don't want to bring any baggage to the table. I don't want to come to somebody's door with baggage and I don't want to look at them and, and assume, you know, they, they, they have a certain amount of baggage. When I was knocking on doors, I was making assumptions about people and their houses and their cars all the time. And it was all, and I wasn't always wrong, but it never got me anywhere. If, and I would have to take this moment of like neutrality and just to say, this is who I am. This is, this is the party that I'm with. This is what I'm running for. And that's it. The absolute like flat neutrality. And Things would get tense, but the, there was a moment where I, I had talked to this person. I said, look, you know, I I want all of my neighbors to thrive, all of them. I want you to thrive. I, I don't it, I want if you're a Republican, I want you to thrive. If you're a Democrat, if you're agnostic, <laughs> whatever, you know, I want you, I want you to thrive. I don't care if you're a Christian or you know, Muslim or black or white. It, I, I want you to thrive. And that's very difficult to do. It's not difficult. It's complex. It's a very complex thing to do whenever you have uh, people from very different uh, backgrounds and dreams, and you know, to accomplish. But I, I truly do feel that it's something that can that can happen. But it takes a lot of like I don't even know if it's work. I mean, if it was work, but you know, is it? How, you know, if you, if you think about, you know, yourself, I mean, your, your worst day, okay, like, of, if, of hearing news or the worst week and how badly, you know, the, the online, you know, uh, presence made you personally feel. If I could tell you that can be taken away, wouldn't like, it, it's not work. And that's what it became for me. It was, I was making calls to people, you know, when, at the time anyways, you know, the country could be perceived as, you know, some of its lowest moments in, you know, in modern history, but I felt wonderful. I felt great. You know, it was like, it was a salve. It wasn't work. It it was, it was time consuming. Yeah. But man, I didn't think it was like, I've worked before. This didn't feel like work. It felt like I, I finished three or four hours of trying to call people and I felt fantastic. I don't know if I never knew if I did any good for the other person uh, on the other end of the line, but at least for me, I felt great. It's very tough in the 21st century America 
I understand there are a lot of people that have been, you know, putting in a lot of work and that are very frustrated with the direction that the country, um, you know, has taken for a long time. I mean, not just the past year or the past four years, it's the past 40 years or the past 400 years, you know, whatever it may be, you know, people are, you know, frustrated, but it is, um, democracy moves slowly. It moves very, very slowly. And I think that at some point in my life, I thought, Oh, there's, you know, there's going to be like a, there's going to be a superhero that comes along and just fixes it all. You know, we're going to have an FDR that's just going to come and solve everything, but it just doesn't work that way. And I wouldn't want it to anyways. Yeah, there's no way in hell I would want that anymore. Yeah. There was, I used to want that. I used to crave having somebody just to come in and just save us. But no, it's not it at all. It is, it is 300 plus million moving pieces. You know, that really has to do slow, minute work. And at least for me, it was an hour. All I did was an hour a month. That's it. I go to my county meetings an hour a month. I sat in the corner and I shut up an hour a month. That's nothing, you know? And it sounds like, I mean, I didn't mean to make this a theme. This is is totally (laughs) coincidental, but it seems like you have to have a lot of patience to, you know, believe in politics. There are, you know, plenty of people out there that have that are, you know, that are very frustrated by politics, and um, you know, and, and admittedly, maybe that is, you know, a point of privilege for me where I'm able to do this. And but, you know, if it's if that's what it is, that's what it is, you know, and just try and try and keep on steering it towards towards some place of, you know, that you're in in a direction of of you know righteousness or justice or whatever it might be, you know, just it's. It's very. It can be very, so very frustrating. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's, it can be very rewarding too. There, there's been so much negativity, and then here you are talking about you know how much you've enjoyed connecting with people and that people aren't alone. You know, I, man, I can't find the words, but it does mean something to me. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for sharing it all with me. Yeah, yeah. There's and and to to be fair, I mean, there was, you know, there there were people that screamed. I mean, at you. You know, at me, you know, and, and it was, I mean, I couldn't believe, you know, how the, the vitriol, uh, but you know, it's, it, it, you just have to kind of shrug it off. I mean, really, there's another, there was always another phone call to make afterwards. It, it was, it wasn't ever easy, even, you know, talking, it didn't matter even with people from my own party. Some, those are some of the most, it can be some of the most frustrating you know, conversations. If I, if I were to balance them, I said, I, Oh, that's, that was one thing that was kind of fascinating is that I would have expected it to just be, you know, people from the opposing party that were going to be the most frustrating conversations, but it wasn't, you know, it was people from my own party that would think, Oh God, I don't, I, don't, I can't represent that at all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really genuinely hope people start to participate locally and to recognize the value in it. And it's, Sorry to keep on ramble, a ramble on this, but <laughs> something I thought of the other day was if we think about politics in, in say the like the fifties or sixties or seventies, they were really entrenched in in a lot of different things. There were social organizations, you know, like the Kiwanis Club or the Elks Club or the Moose Club, you know, whatever it may be. There was these these self, these um, the, you know the Knights of Columbus or something. They were these social organizations, and some of them had a, you know, a religious backbone to them, and other ones didn't. They were just purely social. And but they were there was a lot of politics that politicking that was going on with those organizations. They would have people running for state representative that would come and speak to them, speak to this crowd of these social organizations, or unions. You know, unions. I think I can't remember the statistics, but it was like the. One out of every three people in America belonged to a union, I think, in the in the 60s. And so you would have these natural organizations for organi- organizing and for, you know, for politics. And, and the ability to move quickly was, you know, you had that. You had that already set. But we don't have those things, you know, now. I mean, it's it's you really have to get involved because and to be patient with it because you don't have this thing that you just pay a monthly due for and you're there with, you know, and you get introduced to other people because you're all part of this club. You really have to say, look, I'm, I'm here in hopes of, of fighting for, for fighting for a better way. I think that's a pretty good, good spot to like leave us here. I think that's a good ending point. What do you think? 
I think that sounds great. Yeah, man. Are you going to hit the road again once, uh, once and if the world kind of goes back I, to normal? Man, this, this is, um, I, I don't know if I, you read the story about me meeting the drummer, uh, in this yeah, area. Yeah, I heard. Oh, I heard all about it. Um, yeah, it was, um, we have been like that we are in each other's, uh, kind of COVID bubble so that we uh, still kind of see one another. I don't really see many other people. But I think once I finish this room up, rebuilding this room, I think that we're going to start doing some uh, some fun recording. And then hopefully, hopefully in a year, you know, to start touring again, that would be fun. Yeah, which which project is this one? Uh, Chase, Chasing 76. Cool, cool, cool. I, uh, I saw that online. I'll throw a link up and then so people can find it. Uh, in, oh, cool. is, is Red Collar ever going to do anything again, maybe? I think everybody love would love to. We um, we John the drummer lives in New Zealand, uh, and Mike Mike lives in Indiana. Uh, Andrew still lives in North Carolina, and then Beth and I are here. So it's it's very you know can can be very 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 difficult to. But I think that everybody you know is it's like would you know would love to, and it's one of those experiences where we don't really have to practice very much uh, you know to to play the show i mean it's if we're all in the room i think that we can all just like play the show then but uh it may take a little so a little bit more work now but i'd love to love to get the like play play more with those guys i just found out i think we we finally sold out of welcome home vinyl we're very close we only have a we only have a couple more couple more of them so that that kind of feels good i need to go track that down i had it on cd in my car for a long time i don't think oh I yeah uh, but I was I was lucky enough. I got to see you guys in your home home area of Durham at one of Scotty Sandwich's, you know, Death of Falls. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's such, those are those are great, 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 great times. I I I I really miss really miss Scotty. I really miss Scotty. He was somebody I saw with with a, lot, a great deal of frequency, and really miss seeing him on a regular basis. Well, I think we've rambled on long enough. Anything else you want to mention? Throw out there. Talk about. <laughs> No, man, but, you know, th- thanks, thanks, thanks for doing this. I think it's terrific, and I hope people, you know, get something out of it. And um, it, it, it can be very, very frustrating, you know, looking, looking at the, the news and the headlines. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just it's, democracy is a very, very slow process. And if you want to get involved, it's, it's just waiting, waiting for you to do so. So hopefully you get involved.